She's new to being manager. Uh, do you know Jean's song? She was the manager. She moved over to. So Tommen has sort of like two groups research informatics and academic and critical engagement. And so um, there were some sort of changes that happened there. At the, uh, Tommen itself has like 16, 18 librarians. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. We can go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to the Tools and Technology Seminar Series, which just provides a nice place um, on a weekly basis every Thursday for us to talk about various tools and technologies, methodologies that are out there. Um, as I mentioned last week, I am scheduling for next semester, so if I have any volunteers, um, that certainly makes my life easier, so please let me know if you are interested. There are still some open slots. Um, there's a sign-in sheet that's going around. If you haven't signed it yet, please do so before you leave. It just helps with the pizza, um, helps us know how many people came, how much pizza to get, and justifies our offering pizza. And of course, we want to continue to be able to do that. So today, I am pleased to welcome our speaker, James Yang, and he is the Associate Research Scientist in the School of Nursing. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> like the title say, I'm talking about GWAS study. And uh, you can use GWAS to do a lot of things, but I only focus on very small research question, that is for multivariate phenotypes. And then because of multivariate phenotypes, and you want to identify associations, so it's called identify pleiotropic genes. Can you introduce yeah. yourself a little more what's okay. the background? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm a research scientist at School of Nursing, but I'm my PhD in statistics. So mostly I work in the grant and research office. My primary job is to develop grants for the faculties in School of Nursing. So basically I just help them to do the and propose data analysis and power and sample size calculation. In addition to that, I also have my own research. So this is part of my research, and I developed a grant for that because I collaborate with some investigators in GWAS study, and I found okay, this is an important topic. That's why I organize. Before coming here, I work for <laughs> okay, it's no longer. I work. I graduated in 2002 from University of Florida. I buy, 2002. After I graduated, I worked for Honeyford Hospital in Detroit for about 10 years. After that, I went here. So when I was in Detroit, in Honeyford Hospital, I collaborated with all doctors in, in the hospital. I mean, because they also work on you know, grants. So I, I did a consulting work with them. Thank you. Anything else? Do you also develop like, statistical methods? Yeah, yeah, this is the method I developed. <laughs> so basically today I will, I'm going to cover what is GWAS and then because I'm a statistician so I work with data so I will talk about the data structure and uh, the research question. After that I will, deal, I will do a quick review for existing methods and my methods. So to carry out GWAS study you need at least two different data files. One is genotype data, the other is the phenotype data. For genotype data, usually you get that from you know, running sleep array. So for example, you, once you have cell array, you have cell file, and then you, you call a genotype coding program to run the genotype coding. Then you have a, like this one, rectangular array. So each column represents one individual. Each row represents one sleep or one marker. And the data are usually coded as 0, 1, 2, as a number of reference alleles. You also will get a annotation file. So from annotation file, you know the, uh, what the reference allele is. So you can know the genotype. But when we do analysis, we just look at this data file, this genotype file. And uh, usually, the number of individual is in a scale of 1,000. So n is about 1,000, 1,000, 2,000. But the number of SNPs is usually right now usually in one million. So this will this this paper will be very, very long. Okay. So this is the genotype file. And then you will also have a phenotype file. The 
in fact, I usually determine by your research question what kind of research you want to do. So you will collect like individuals, you know, demographic variable and those disease status or other things. So I arrange as you know, individual, any individual, one phenotype, the other. Okay. So maybe case control studies. If you just did a case control study for genome, so the filter is zero and one, but because you need to spend so much money on you know, each chip, so you will collect more than, you know, like collect many, many variables. And in our study, you will collect more than that. So the question is, if, can you find an association between your SNP and uh, your phenotype? The simple question is, if I only have one phenotype, then the we call association studies, GWA association study. It will find the association between your SNP and the phenotype. So you have two vectors, find association or correlation. So it's very simple. But you have multiple, multiple phenotypes. So it's be, the outcome become multivariate. Then you want to find the association between each one and the multivariate. And so the GWA is very simple. Just find association. Do one at a time and do one million times. So before we you know jump into any specific question, usually when when at least for me to do a GWAS study, I will consider three things. One is how to model the uh, you know how to model build the statistics to test the association. Because because we want the model to have a good property because and uh, based on the type of outcome variable, we may use different statistics, and then we need to. To build a model that can have a good power. Good power means statistical power means that if there is anything, any signal, we can find it. And uh, then the other thing is computation efficiency. This is usually related to multivariate because right now for the univariate outcome, it's very efficient to do the G1 study. There is software out there. But for multivariate phenotypes, if you think you know the algorithm, you know you need to do the inverse co uh, covariance method. So, when the number of multivariate increase, the covariance matrix increase, and then you need to do calculate calc back loop function. Even you use a new option algorithm, it still takes a lot of time. If one test takes one second, one second should be very fast. But you need to do one million times, it will take about 11 days just to run the analysis. So it's very, not very efficient. And then sometimes if you do consulting work, you know, you do that. 11 days later, they say, I want to change the set of phenotypes. Reduce or increase, you need to do that again. So you need to consider computation efficiency. So how many multiple phenotypes do you usually encounter? I will tell you that next next slide. And then when I, once you have some signal findings, you want to <coughs> be able to interpret results. Interpret that means that you need to interpret results that your you know customer can understand, not just you. <coughs> so because right now we usually use like Alpha matrix or Illumina, Alpha one six has one million SNPs, one million marks. Usually, that's you know enough because of linkage degree. You don't need to have more than that, that many SNPs. So usually, just by the commercial array. So you cannot do anything change unless you want to do very specific research, or custom array. Otherwise, you just by commercial one. So you cannot change that. But you can change. You can determine your outcome phenotypes. And uh, it's very key, I want to say that it's very common to have a modified phenotype. For example, like hypertension, you, have, you can measure SPP, DPP. And uh, for diabetes, usually we'll measure the uh, glucose level or HbA1c. And uh, in the last study I, I'm working on, sometimes the pills like nicotine dependence or alcohol dependence, they already de design a questionnaire. Like usually they have about six questions. You know, to six question and ask patient to respond what kind of symptom or kind of you know how many cigarettes you smoke. So this the, this one is about six to ten. And for another study, this one published in Nature in 2010. They, this is a print, and they study one, three, and seven phenotypes. They studied it together or separate? Yeah, I think it's together, but they use it. So you know you can have from two to one hundred, depends on your study. But right now it's very common to have about six to ten outcomes. 
and okay. So we want to talk. We want to do a quick review about existing method before I jump into my proposed method. So for existing method, I just use a simple bivariate data as an example to explain that you can easily extend that to you know multivariate. For bivariate, you have at least three conditions, three, three types. One is all of them are continuous. Or one is continuous, the other is binary, or number of number of above. And uh, for continuous variables, how can you do? The first thing is, oh, is by extent of the univariate, we use univariate we use ANOVA. For multivariate, we use MANOVA. <coughs> so you know ANOVA in you know undergraduate study course. So this is just extension of MANOVA, but. It's easy to do, and there is always software out there. You just plug in to play, run it. But MANOVA is not very powerful because it has a strong assumption. And uh, actually, we did a simulation study shows that the MANOVA is not very powerful compared to the other methods. And uh, MANOVA is usually powerful when actually the, co the correlation between phenotypes, the outcome variable, are negative. But in practice, usually your outcomes are positively correlated. More likely. I guess it's actually the opposite behavior of the genetic effects on the correlation. So if your effects are in the positive direction and the correlation is negative, it is powerful. Mm -hmm. But your effects are in the negative direction, then the positive correlation yeah. is more. So it's yeah. not actually just negative correlation, but it is powerful. But yeah, you are right. But when we did a simulation study, you know, we just found out. But there's a more serious questions. This is only for bivariate. But for multivariate, it's, you are not going to get all negative, right? because one is negative to the other. They are two negative. X is negative to Z, Y, Y is negative to Z, or X and Z have to be positive. So the other is GE, the generalized estimating equations. G is very efficient compared to the other method. But in this case, we did GE, and we just, when first I did, I ran a simulation to see how good GE is. So G did not control type one error rate. So it's very powerful, but it produced a lot of false positives. Later, I found actually found a paper in 2000, about more than 10 years ago. They say G in this way did not control type one error rate. So although it's good, but you know it's not fair comparison. So the other principal component, as I think people do that, the idea is that you have multivariate phenotypes, you condense. You summarize multivariate that to one variable. So here you can use principal component to pick the first principal component as an outcome variable. Then you have univariate outcome variable. Then it becomes the traditional, you know, GWAS study, one outcome, two vector, one sleep. But this is only you know powerful when the, all the outcome variables are highly correlated. Otherwise you will lose information for the second, third, fourth, you know. Principal components. <coughs> because you just pick the first one, you lose the information, you ignore the remaining. But if you keep the two second, third, you become go back to the original question. And uh, there's a test that's just you know use a p value. There's a more. But, but we, I want to go too much, but it's just a, you can go to look at this paper. And uh, for one binary, one continuous. Then one is to naive treat the binary as continuous, so you still can do that. The, pro the program still will run, but you just ignore the model assumption. Or you can dichotomize the bi continuous part to binary, so you only have four combinations. Four combinations, you can just run the like multinomial regression or cumulative logic, depending on how you want to model that. So it's simplified. And, uh, I think the better approach is regression approach because you have bivariate variables. You just, you know, decompose the bivariate into marginal and the continual, the part of marginal and continual distribution. For each part, you can model it, the distribution based on the data structure. So that will become easier. So either conditional, unconditioned, continual, and then marginal condition, or continual, conditional and discrete, binary, marginal, binary. I think this is good, but this cannot be extended to be more than two because you have more than two. You have many many channel conditional distributions, so it's very difficult to model that many many conditions. 
And uh, the, the final one, the other is latent variable approach. That is, you assume, you have, you have to assume, assume there's a latent variable condition on this on observed latent variable. The observation outcome is independent. So condition independence assumption imposed on that, then, then you can condition on that, you can decompose it, become a product of those observation. The, the, the question for this report later <coughs> is that, I, at least, I, I actually in this paper, they show that there is an identifiability issue. You cannot, you can identify those things. So latent variable sometimes, you know, is difficult to interpret your results. And uh, for mixed outcome, you can use the, can, you can use the treat all variables continuous or dichotoma, dichotoma is all into binary or latent variable. I've been seeing the structural equation modeling, but structural modeling assume, you know, complex structure. I don't, personally, I don't, you know, think it's very, I don't think it's easy to verify those assumptions based on your data. Okay, so here I propose my approach. Start with the continuous variable. So, start with by, by binary only, then you will extend to multivariate. For binary, you have two bivariate continuous variable. So for each one, each variable and each snip, you, you can, for one mar marginal variable and one snip, you can calculate a correlation or association and get a p-value. Here, p is, I just treat it as a strength of evidence. For the other marginal variable, Marginal phenotype and the SNP, you can get another p value. Okay. You can use, just use correlation. But for say, we usually try to, try to like to use regression. So one outcome is SNP, regression variable. And the, the thing of regression is you can add other demographic variables to adjust for those variables. Once you have two p values, and then you want to study the correlation association between those, outcome and the SNP. I just consider continuous non-decreasing combination function. Here I propose to use the feature combination function. Just minus two log P, sum of minus two log P values. And uh, in statistics, under no, under no association, this follow chi square distribution, no sum of chi square distribution, so this is chi square distribution. But, the issue here is that Y1 and Y2, the outcome variable, are correlated. So the statistics here, they are correlated. So they did not follow, follow a simple chi-square, sum of chi-square distribution. One way to deal with that is to run a permutation test, permute the label of the individuals, and then run them, and then create a reference distribution. But you, you think about it, you have 1,000 or okay, 1,000 individuals, so it time consuming. And uh, usually, the significant label is usually not 0.05, it's 10 to minus 6. So you need to run permutation more than 10 to minus 6 times to have enough accuracy to estimate p-values. And 10 to 6, suppose that's 10 to 6, then times 1 million times. That's the time you need to. Of course, you can use adaptive method, but it's still time consuming. So, how to deal with that? When I look at that, then I, then I thought, okay, under no hypothesis, no solution, this actually follow a gamma distribution. Okay. We also we'll say something else, scale chi square. Some of dependent chi square actually follow gamma scale with two parameters, k and x. And scale and shape parameter. So, if they, they follow gamma distribution, the mean and the variance is those two unknown parameters. So the goal is, if we can estimate k and x, we know the distribution of this, then we can calculate p value of t. Is that an approximate distribution? Yes. Or uh, this one, this one, is not asymptotic. It, it's very accurate. The matter, even for small sample size, for this test statistics. 
it should be very accurate because you know you calculate p value based on about one one thousand sample size, one thousand one thousand. So under normal process, you take in the sexual limit. So this one it will be chi square chi square. The issue just you know they are dependent chi square. So some dependent chi square gamma is a good approximation to model that. Like, like you say normal assumption, normal assumption. You know if the distribution follow normal. I say it's a normal distribution. It's not. The only I can say is approximate, but very accurate, very close. Okay. How about to say? Like you know, in factorial, it's sterling approximation. Factorial sterling approximation is approximate, but it's very accurate. And, okay. and that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. So from the different side, you have these two unknown variables. From the sample size. You know, because they are sum of chi squares, so they are mean and the variance. Okay. But I show that for the variance, because variance is a function of a correlation between the phenol types. So you just do a simple calculation, this one. So this just, uh, if you give a number of row, the correlation between phenol types, you can numerically calculate these values. And uh, I did that. If, uh, for different value of row from minus one to one, the value of covariance, p value. Okay? So you are plotting the covariance of the two p values on the y axis? Uh, plotting a covariance for different row value, I calculate for the covariance of this one. Okay? Covariance. So. So you look at this, it's uh, you know, easy to approximate with the polynomial. So I just approximate it, I just, you know, numerical approximate. So I calculate polynomial coefficient of those polynomial. And uh, the difference between those polynomial and uh, the exact the value I calculate from the previous graph is less than 0.01. So it's very accurate, I mean. I mean, because you calculate the values here and uh, the number is a plus two times this. So the difference here is no, negligible. So if we so if you have the correlation, so I summarize. The, uh, my proposed method is you can calculate marginal p-values for each outcome. Then you can parallel to multiple outcome. Then you can estimate the correlation from phenotypes. Then plug in to plug in the phenotype from correlation to this one and then the previous two unknown degree. These two equations. You can estimate K and S. So you know the distribution of this one. So you can calculate p-value of this statistics. This is different from Brown's correction and Cox's correction. Uh, by treating the correlation matrix to a higher moment. Brown's correction is to take that uh, chi-square, but scale it back depending on the correlation. No, I did not do that. Did not do that. No. But how is it different from those established correction matrices? <coughs> no, I haven't thought about that. Right. So, so Fisher's method eventually, if it works well, it's a chi-square distribution. So the, not always. Right. So the first, the simplest correction by Brown is to scale that chi-square back by a C. Like you now have P1. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. C, C chi-square is actually the gamma. Then you scale chi-square. Right, scale yeah. chi-square. So it's equivalent to chi-square, to gamma. And then yours is different because you introduce higher moment. No, no, so two. Because C chi-square, they still have two. But no. they have C and C, another, C1 and C2. C and C Chi-square only has one parameter, and then C is the <coughs> so there are two parameters. They are equivalent to those two, if you do a calculation. So still have two unknown. C Chi-square, scale Chi-square. The same, the same. It's the same. The same. Right. The same. This one, I use gamma, because, but actually it, it's the equivalent to scale Chi-square. One method. But then there is a cost, K-O-S-T, cost correction. Like no, I don't know. So you can study that one. It's Try to map to cheap distribution and try to scale it. Oh, I did not know. I just consider. Uh, 
went wrong, just PR or something like that. Wrong. Which I actually think is. 1976 or something, paper. And I, I think I, I, could, I recall that paper because that's for the here they usually because this is based on the large sample theory of it. means that you know for large sample size it follow normal for cost is based on test it is because it's small sample size okay. so they derive this as a t statistics and uh, actually the value is very close. And uh, that's the first thing, because they only consider Christian to up to 0.001, not at least. Not that many turns. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we consider G was usually, you know, have a sample size about 1,000, so no more assumptions is good enough. So, I mean, you can try the cost method as a small sample size, but I don't see any differences there. At least numerically, there's no differences. So you got this Hmm? This digit, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing lots of simulation. No, 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 no need, no need. You just, <coughs> you just, you know. Parametric. Polynomial fix. Polynomial fit. Fit the polynomial to this value, so and this value is calculated from this. For. No, does that mean the values of the C's are going to change for each data no. set, or is it like? No, no, because p value is unity. Uh, Very good. Uh, when you say correlation, you always assume linear correlation. Yeah, we just consider linear correlation. But phenotype, uh, the, the phenotypes, if you have a numerical representation, they might not always a uniform distribution. You're absolutely right. So, like people's height, they are not just uniform. So, how could you assume a linear correlation? So, that's why here I say, you know, you find a correlation between this one and that. But you need to think about the distribution of y1 to determine which function or which statistics to use to calculate the correlation. Sometimes you need to do, like, you know, log or arc sine or square root transformation to calculate correlation. Or you can use the non parametric. To see that candle tau to see the you know concordance discordance correlation. Uh, do you have a numerical trick where you could uh, transform the phenotypes values so that they are they have better uh, numerical property? Yeah. Like in machine learning, they use sigmoid transformations. Yeah, I will show you. Here, you want to calculate p-value. So here, usually, we just use, uh, if continuous, we just do a transformation of outcome variable to make it like normal. Like an inverse normal transformation? Yeah, normal transformation. You can do that, OK? For binary, of course, we usually just use the zero equation. And, uh, and, uh, and usually, I don't worry about that too much, because you know, we have like simple. So. You can do a pass, uh, you know, good transformation to get a good approximation. And then, then the second is to calculate correlation. Usually, you can use non parametric to calculate correlation. I will say that next. You have more than two phenotypes. When I, here. <laughs> two phenotypes, so means the same covariance, you just have pairwise correlation. But that's row one, two, and row one, three. Row one, three, row two, three. Yeah, just expand. So it's very, you know, straightforward extent. So any questions so far? So uh, you showed the relationship between K, S, and the row one, twos. How does it look when you have multiple phenotypes, like the relationship between K, S, row one, two, one, three, and so Yeah, you just, you just have, have many, many. Then, then here it becomes some. Or pairwise correlation okay. because variance, you know, some pairwise or you know, change that no, 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 but depend on how many turn and then some of pairwise.
So I think you are right. I don't consider first two moments. So then the extension to a binary continuous. So this still again consider two variables only. One continuous, one binary. <coughs> and uh, suppose we the the we observe y one and y two. Y two is binary, but we assume here as it is. I assume that this is derived from a latent variable. So I use threshold model to based on latent variable. Yeah, one or zero depend on the underlying, you know, latent variables. Then for given given scenario, you still can calculate a p value from you know continuous or binary outcome. Straightforward is regression and logistic regression. Get p values. Okay, then you can still get a statistics for t. So the question is, when we consider continuous case, we use correlation rule to estimate continuous phenotypes. Here, which I just assume that this y two is derived from the this latent variable w. And uh, if we want to use estimate correlation between y one and w. Then we can use the previous method. But we want to estimate this using the observation y1 and y2. Use, use your data to estimate. You cannot estimate from non measurable data. So, more than 100 years ago, Pearson proposed a by serial correlation. So, this correlation is based on data variable to estimate the correlation between those y1 and the w using the data y1, y2. This only worked for that particular transformation. No, no, it's just use to work from the data y one y two. Observe, don't need to do the transformation. No, from from w to y two, there's a two stepwise transformation. No, I just assume y two is derived from the latent variable w. Right. Based on that model assumption, I assume. But alternative would be treat w, turn w into the liability scale, mm -hmm. where it's not a stepwise transition. Why not? No, I don't. Yeah, you are right, but I don't consider that complex model. Okay. A lot of people run that. They either turn that into liability model or just treat W as the turn that into logic <coughs> and then run linear regression on the logic. Mm -hmm. That would be a different transformation. Yeah, but from your point of view, then because W is uh, unobservable, so you need to apply a tool for that. We don't do that. Because, yeah. Yeah, then you need to assume and then um, distribution. No, no, we don't have W, we have Y2. Right. But people turn W into a logic of W, they run okay. regression on it. Just for logistic regression. Yeah. In this case, you decided to ignore that analytic model curve. You just run a stepwise change, right? Go from W to Y2. That, that yeah. in the previous slide, turn W. Yeah, this one. Y two. Turn it from Y two is a step function system. Yeah, binary function. We observe, function. we observe binary binary values. We just assume that this binary value is derived from W. Because we use that W as a vehicle to derive our model. And that by serial correlation only applies to this transform. Yes, but serial correlation is designed to, to do this, just this. Thank you. So, plug in this, actually, we will estimate correlation between y1 and y2. I think, I think I'm should reverse, sorry. The correlation of this continuous should be larger than this one. Okay. So reverse it. So we have this correlation, but this is a real correlation between observation. This is our vehicle. And uh, because we plug in this, so the, if we use this covariance to estimate this one, actually we overestimate it a little bit. So I just run a simulation. This is when y, two continuous correlation, covariance. And, uh, 
this is one binary one continuous. That will be smaller covariance. But if we use this, we'll overestimate a little bit. So we will sacrifice a little bit of power if we use a larger covariance. But the plus side is that we will increase the we will control of type one error because we still you know <coughs> use larger than required. We won't have a false party under type one error. So for the extension to the the ordinal is very straightforward, use threshold model, then the same. So for those kind of variable, continuous, we can use Pearson correlation, but I, I prefer to use Kendall Tau, non-parametric. And then for by serial, just use binary continuous. Then I extend that if you have a binary binary, you, you can use threshold coloric. And the ordinal continuous is polyserial, polycaric. Okay. So how good are those correlation estimation method? So I ran a uh, correlation from minus 0.9 to 0.9. And uh, then for continuous, this candle is very accurate. And uh, even for continuous binary or continuous ordinal, they are looks good. Or binary, 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 ordinal, ordinal, ordinal. I mean, the correlation estimates Estimate method based on those proposed, you know, existing methods is quite good under this condition. So we just plug in those methods. And then covariance, if they are continuous, they will overlap, of course. And then the worst case is binary, binary. <coughs> this is the continuous, but we, the real covariance is smaller. So we will use a larger one to estimate that. So finally, that's the method. And then the following are just simulation and the real data analysis. So any questions? So first, we just use a genetic model. The phenotype, number of, minor, number of reference allele is followed monomial with minor allele frequency, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, or 0.5. And then genetic model, recessive, active, or dominant models for the effect size, genetic effect. And then for genetic effect size, zero means no effect size or model effect size. And then we have, here we join consider continuous binary. So this is the latent phenotypes. And then we have the continuous here. OK. So this is when under no hypothesis, no effect size at the 0.05 second level. So, so I try. For different minor real frequency and the correlation between phenotypes. This is our proposed method, and uh, here we compare that with permutation method. Because it's a simulation, we know the value of the latent variable. So we also run that to see as this is a gold standard, the best case scenario. And I know they all control type 1 error rate. So, I'm okay, you're talking about genome-wide association study. Really no, no, no. This is just to say, next one I will show you a uh, more stringent type of error. And uh, this is for the same. Under alternative hypothesis, there is effect size for different effect size. And uh, you can see that first, the power depends on the effect size, the larger the power. And uh, the power increases when the uh, minor real frequency increase. That's why, you know, if it's very rare, you know, phenotype, the genotypes, real frequency, it's very difficult. It needs a lot of samples to detect that. What was your sentence? Hmm? No, I mean, if the, the phenotype is very, you know, homogeneous, it's not very heterogeneous. So minor real frequency is very small. In that situation, you need a lot large, large samples to detect. Yeah, I'm just asking what sentence you think for this thing. This is one dollar. I'm sorry? One thousand. One thousand? Just, I usually just see, receive one thousand. There, so I usually just use one thousand. And uh, this is a proposed method and permutation. And the proposed method is very close to permutation method. Because we actually, uh, you know, to model the permutation distribution using gamma distribution. And uh, this is the best case scenario. So, Actually, 
force method uh, has smaller power than <laughs> well lost a little bit of power compared to permutation because you know we use a larger you know, covariance estimate. But now I don't think it's not it's very very much. And uh, this is under the other scenario. So here we consider multivariate case with mixed scales. So in this case, six phenotypes, two continuous, two binary, two ordinals. And uh, this is the stringent candle mass for type binary rate. So no effect size, this is that's under no analysis. So and this is later means we just use the you know W1, the continuous variables. Those unreserved use the W here for later. And this is our proposed method. And uh, the other two is treat this one is treat every variable as continuous variables. And then this one is treated, you know, just dichotomize every variable into binary. I'm sorry, I didn't want what significance level do you want? 10 to minus 4. Minus. And, uh, and uh, we just, we try different value and then 4.5, it will reach 0.96. The best case is. For correlation 0.35, wouldn't you call that a little inflated or the latent? This is not very large, 0.35, it's very common. No, that's what I'm saying. The type 1 error, it's like yeah, a little bit. Oh. 5 times 10 to the minus yeah, 4, right? Yeah. So it's inflated. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for power, is, you know, this is the best case scenario, so no one should beat it. And uh, our method is a little bit close to that. And uh, then, of course, if you just use binary, you will reduce power a lot. Now, this case will reduce about half. And uh, finally, the real data analysis, we use the SAGE data, the study of addiction genetic environment. It's a DB gap, DB gap data from a collection of three studies. So, from these three studies. And uh, the total sample size is about 4,000 from 330. But we only select unrelated individuals. Some of them are duplicates because they want to do control, so we can remove one of it. And then a few of them, there's about less than 100 are family data. So the majority are independent individuals. So we use independent individuals. And, the two, and then, then if the individual has no phenotypes, we also remove that data. So the remaining is 2,775. And uh, they, they use Illumina 1 million array. So it's 1 million saves, and uh, we did a quality control, like Hardy Weinberger equivalent test and uh, minor real frequency. So the no final number is 7,700 by 53,000 SNPs. So here we use a few types of six questions on this. This is standard test for nicotine dependence. So there are six questions. One is how soon after you wake up do you smoke your first cigarette? So the answer is zero, one, two, three, four. How do you know? Based on how, how long. And then second question is do you find it difficult to refrain from smoking in places where it was forbidden? Binary variable. The third is also binary. Which cigarette would you hate most to give up? And the fourth question is, how do you know how many cigarettes per day do you smoke? The larger the number, the more likely to be nicotine-dependent addiction. So the five is, do you smoke more frequently during the first five hours after working? And do you smoke if you are so ill that you are in bed most of the day? So they only ask the question, and then for clinicians, they usually will get a sum score from the, first, the six questions. And the uh, clinician will all make decision based on this number only. So determine if they are greater than cut off point six. So if you are six or more, you are more likely to be in nicotine dependence. So they will give you different you know, treatment. Uh, 
based on the answers. And the answer is from 0 to 10. And uh, many, some studies just use the, this total score of binary to run the analysis. But we think we can do better by using the first six together. So this is the simple correlation between those six, you know, questions. So it's from 0 0.44 to 0 0.77. Petrochemical correlation. Just pairwise correlation. I use candle. I use candles. You can use spheres, but because some of them are binary or you know, so I just use non binary. Just give you an idea about the correlation. Yeah, even if you try the, the other correlation measure, it will be very close. So this is a simple distribution. The first six question, and then total. Although total is from 0 to 10, but no one is, you know, getting the 10, perfect 10 score. So 0 to 9, the simple distribution. And the last one, cut point. OK. So first, we did a marginal test for each outcome variable and the SNP. But we also, we use regression. Depends on, you know, all continuous or binary, binary logic regression. And, uh, and uh, we also put a demographic variable as such as age, gender, race, into, to adjust for those three demographic variables. And uh, the reason, this is the QQ part. So this one, this observed p-value, this is expected p-value, this diagonal line. If they are above the diagonal line, means observed p-value, because it's log, minus log 10. So the larger means the smaller p-value. So if it's above the, the diagonal line, means that's most likely to be significant. So since that not, not many of them are significant. And uh, if we, this is when we use our proposal to combine the first six. And uh, okay. And uh, if we pick 10 to minus six cutoff point, you have to pick one. Then only the first question, identify one SNP. The, uh, the third question, identify the other SNP. None of those identify any SNP. And then even if you binary, only identify the same one as FT and D1. Okay. And then our proposed method combines six phenotypes and identifies nine SNPs. There are nine different regions, but nine SNPs come together. Different regions. Some is kind of about basically different, different chromosomes. So. Do you have to use for these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not. Yeah, we. Hello, yeah. Hello, how, how can the same threshold? They are all smaller than this one. The other studies are smoking. Sometimes it hits the clinic receptor. You hit it? We did not check. <laughs> <laughs> so the conclusion. So is, which one? So do you think two SNPs? Make more is more reasonable or nice nips is more reasonable. We don't know. Actually, this is an important study because we just find a subset so that we can publish it. And if we, 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 we actually we did a compare to find a, to go to a gym back to see if there is any you know region that has been published. I do find some of them are published in the other paper, but not all of them. So maybe they miss that, or maybe, I mean maybe. Some of them means, or maybe we just force part. We don't know. You have to do the experiment to identify, verify that. So we propose a genome-wide solution study for mixed scale phenotypes. Okay, and uh, we show that we at least we can control type one array, and uh, we have good power. And uh, the computational computational efficiency is proportional to that of marginal test. Because you can do marginal tests simultaneously. And uh, if, you have, um, if you want to do multivariate tests, it, it will increase some like proportion or exponential to the number of phenotypes. But we, because you know, when we do a test, we just do a multiplication plus multiplication table lookup. So it's very fast to calculate the p value of our proposed statistics. 
and the real data using Sage shows that combining multiple phenotypes can increase the power. On the, the last one is usually for the customer lab. Usually, the problem can identify gene that contribute to the common liability to complex disease. Because sometimes they are more interested to see a set of phenotypes. They have some hypothesis about you know, the structure of those phenotypes. Or sometimes, like psychiatry or psychology, they, they, they thought sometimes your characteristic cannot be measured you know, by one variable only. So they will measure a set of variables. They want to study the correlation between the set of those variables and the those, you know, explanatory variables. Here, see. So that will help them to interpret that result. And uh, thank you. Questions first. Any other questions? So your nine SNPs, if they make biological sense, that will be yeah. a boost for the paper. Yeah. Uh, the second is if you find the PP plot can prove, but you really reassure the reviewers you might even want to repermit your sage data. So you act act like this implementation based to that. Oh. What if you re-permit your sage data that plot flattens back that, then will be problem. We'll think about it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Did you do any comparison between your method and Manova? Yeah, we did. I didn't ask you that. We did. Okay. Manova is actually about half the power of our, of our method. I'm sorry? Manova is about half the power of the our proposed method. Not only me, but the other paper also did. Because MANOVA is so well known. Many paper just compare MANOVA as a standard. And uh, MANOVA is about two thirds to half of the other methods. So MANOVA is not very powerful. Thank you.